Now let's talk about a few ideas to help you get going with Aaron Stabell's Bountiful. Now this piece is going to pretty much rely solely on the double vertical stroke. So when you're playing your double vertical strokes and this piece, you want to make sure that the motion is initiated from the wrist in a fluid continuous motion. What you want to avoid doing is locking up the wrist and playing the strokes with your forearm or opening and closing your fingers in order to throw the mallets into the bars. So here's what it looks like if you're using your wrist in that with that fluid motion. As opposed to locking up your wrist and using your arm. Or using your fingers as in an opening and closing motion to throw the mallets into the bars. Now, depending on what kind of rhythms or note values you have, the double vertical strokes are going to stay identical. And a great example of that is at the beginning and in the middle of this piece, where the beginning starts off with block chords with both hands playing double vertical strokes simultaneously. Now, a little further on down in the piece, you're going to have a variation on that theme in which the same thing is presented, however, instead of block chords, they're offset by one sixteenth note. What you want to make sure to avoid is changing the motion in any way when it goes from eighth notes to sixteenth notes. It doesn't matter how fast you're going or the rhythm, the motion is going to stay constant throughout both of those themes. A good way to work on that is by simply playing some open fifths. Let's take a C and a G in both hands, and we'll play eighth notes um, with block chords. Now let's switch to offset sixteenth notes, and the motion should stay the exact same because it is the same and it's going at the same speed. They're just starting at different times. Another characteristic of this piece, and that's in a lot of Aaron's music, is his use of space. As percussionists, we're almost inherently trained to be as busy as possible and feel really comfortable being as busy as possible. Look at any kind of Phillips Sousa march, and that's what we're really comfortable with. We want to be busy. We want our hands to be moving. So when we have a lot of space, 
a lot of times we're not quite sure not only of what to do with that space, but how we should, you know, react to that space. What you want to do in this piece, and if you see this in another piece down the road, you want to embrace it. That space is what's going to give a lot of this music and a lot of these notes as much meaning as possible. Now, in this piece, he's going to do this in two different ways. He's going to have a lot of rests that you'll need to count through and you'll need to respect the rests, and also through the use of fermatas. Now, with the fermatas, you want to make sure that you're not giving each fermata the exact same amount of time. If they all start to have the same length, the audience is going to pick up on that and it's going to start becoming really, really predictable. And at the end, you may not even recognize them as fermatas. They may just kind of blend into the rests. So a good way to vary the length of the fermatas, excuse me, is to find chords that, to be honest, that you really like. Maybe you like the way one sounds versus another. And what you would do is the one that you really like, maybe give that one just a little bit more length of time in order for it to set and for it to sit with the audience. Once again, try to avoid having them all be the exact same length of time. Now another great part of this piece is his use of different themes and different characters. So you want to make sure that each one is unique. So let's go back to the beginning and we'll start with that eighth note block chord theme. What you want to make sure to avoid is having all of the eighth notes have the, the exact same dynamic and the exact same intensity. So here's what that, that would sound like. It starts on an offbeat, but the audience won't know that because they don't have music in front of them. A good way to help them hear that is by giving a slight emphasis to that very first note and to the first uh, new inversion that's within this chord. So give each change just a little bit of emphasis and fall away from that. Here's what that'll sound like. Now we have a little bit of context as far as where it falls within the measure and how it relates to that resolution. Another really cool theme happens about halfway through and it sounds like this. Have as much fun with that as you can. Remember, don't make all the notes sound the exact same. You want to have a little bit of style, a little bit of direction, and a little bit of groove with it. So make sure that all the, all the notes don't sound the exact same. And a good way to practice having the themes uh, vary between one another is simply play them right next to each other. Pull them out of the music, play one, and then play the next, and figure out ways you can make them sound unique. Maybe it's way played a little bit slower, maybe it's played a little bit faster, maybe you vary the tempo within each one. As long as you're making them unique and they have their own unique and special character, you'll be on the right track. Now I want to say a big thank you to Aaron Stabell for writing this piece for me. Um, I've been lucky to have a lot of really great composers agree to write for this project, but it's even more special when one of those composers is one of your absolute very best friends. So it really means a lot to me and it's really special for him to be included in this project. And I hope that these ideas have, will help you get going with Aaron Stabell's Bountiful. <laughs>